Hi there, my name's Mike Dunbar, and I'm sitting in a handmade Sackback Windsor chair. Let me show it to you. This is a remarkable piece of furniture. It's lightweight, but very durable. It's so strong that large numbers of antique Windsor chairs remain tight as the day they were made 250 years later. It's a perfect design. It's so perfect that in two and a half centuries, no one has been able to improve on it. It's a comfortable chair. Why is it comfortable? Because the old guys understood the requirements of comfort, and they were not willing to compromise them to accommodate the whims of fashion. There's another reason why I'm so pleased with this chair. I made it. In this step-by-step -step sequence, I'm going to show you the process that I used. If you follow my instruction, you'll end up with an identical sackback Windsor chair. Then you too will be able to proudly proclaim to your family and to your friends, I made this. The process I'm going to show you has a proven track record. It's the result of my having taught Windsor chair making for 38 years. 20 of those years, my wife and I ran a school named the Windsor Institute. The classes that we taught there, on which this instruction is based, were famous, and they were known throughout the world. Let's get to work. A Windsor chair begins with the seat. A solid wooden seat is what distinguishes a Windsor chair from other types of chairs like Queen Anne's or Ladderbacks. They have a four-piece seat frame. The seat blank is glued up of two pieces of eastern white pine. A two-piece seat is less likely to split due to seasonal movement than a single wide board. The blank is inch and three quarters thick. The first step is to prepare the seat blank so that we can work on it. This is the bottom surface. And so I'm going to work on this with a jack plane, which will get rid of any tool marks and any glue. Now that leaves the surface a little rough, but it's the bottom of the chair and nobody sees it. This is the top of the seat. Some of the seat, the area called the platform, is going to remain in the finished chair. So I'm going to work this with a smooth plane. That'll give me a finished surface. This is the seat template for the sack back chair. I place it on here on the blank with the grain running in this direction. Hold it down and trace the shape. I like to use a number two pencil. It gives me a nice dark line that's easy to see. I'm making some registration marks at the end of this line here and of the center line. When I remove the seat, the template, I'll connect those two dots with a straight edge. And we'll be using these two lines through the making of the chair. Next step, we cut it out on the bandsaw. Now we'll cut out the seat on the bandsaw, safety first.
And there we go. A Windsor chair is a light and a delicate design. The problem is we need a big thick piece of wood in the middle of the seat or the middle of the chair to serve as the anchor for both the undercarriage and the back. That required, that's going to give us the strength that we need. The problem is to place a thick piece of wood in the middle of a delicate design. We want to make the seat appear thinner than it actually is. If you look at this seat, you can tell its thickness because you can see this edge here and you can see this edge here and your eye can judge the distance between them. But if I take the seat and I begin to pull the lower edge back out of your line of sight, suddenly you find yourself looking at a very thin line and it's hard to distinguish just how thick that seat is. So that's what we're going to do next, is we're going to shape the outside of the seat to make the seat look like it's thinner and more delicate than it actually is, without sacrificing the strength that we need for the joinery. If we come over here to the chair, you'll see the two shapes that we need. Around most of the seat, we're going to cut the edge to a radius like this. We have joints that are occurring right here, and we need this to be thicker and stronger. So we're going to radius it down like this. Across the front of the seat, where your eye ends up as you look at the chair, there are no joints, and so we can cut away the wood more dramatically, making it appear even thinner. This is how we're going to make the cuts. Let me draw them for you here on the white erase board. We're going to make two types of cuts as we shape the back edge of this seat. The first cut is going to start about here and go all the way around, or the first shape is going to start about here and go around to about here. So the, the majority, the vast majority of the outside is done in this way. There's the edge of the seat. Go up about two fifths, two fifths, and one fifth. Here we'll make a cut at 45 degrees. Then we'll make another cut at about 80 degrees. And you can see that it's not going to take a whole lot to just round this edge. The second cut, which is made only across the front edge, is a series of parallel cuts at 60 degrees. That's going to give us the shape of the profile that we need. Sackback Windsor chair seat is an oval. It's going to have, as we work on it, we're going to have four grain uh, changes of grain direction. And we have to take those into consideration. We're going to get ourselves into trouble. I like to think of the seat as Rover the dog. As long as I'm patting Rover like this, I'm laying down his hair as I lay down over his rump, and he's happy, gives me a kiss. If I come this way, I stand Rover's hair up. He doesn't like that. He turns around and he bites me. Same thing's going to happen to you with making a seat. If you go against the grain, it's going to turn around and bite you. So the seat is basically an oval. I have a degree in French, not in art. Grain direction runs like this through the seat. We have two axes here and here, our, gra our cuts have to start at the short axis and run to the long that way. 
that will keep us always cutting with the grain. If we go back the other way, we're going to tear a great big chunk out of the, of the wood. This is the problem that we want to avoid. We're going to be working with the draw knife. And I'm going to be working on the lower edge like this. If I turn the seat around to work on this other quadrant, and I continue to do what I'm doing, I just cut away the top of the seat, and I've ruined the seat blank. <clears throat> to prevent that from happening, we're going to use this safety tip. This is a red timber crayon. I'm just going to use it to make a red line along the top edge. And that's going to identify for me the edge that I do not want to cut. So think of red as saying to you, danger warning, stop. Do not cut on this edge. We're going to start shaping the outside of this edge, and the tool we're going to use to rough this out is a draw knife. Now you can lay out the two-fifths two -fifths marks if you wish, but you also can work without them, and I prefer to. Starting at this quadrant, we're going to work down to this point where the grain will change. There, there's the, the first cut, the second one. Now we flip. And we work this quadrant here. Now, an important thing to remember about the draw knife is it's a slicing tool. And notice the slicing as I work. This is the front of the seat. This is the center of the pommel. Remember, this is where we make the 60 degree cuts. And they're just a series of parallel cuts made like this. The first cuts are test cuts to see which way the grain is going. Obviously, it's going against me right there. So I'm going to flip around and come this way. And it's just a series of parallel cuts made it about 60 degrees. Right up to the pommel. Right up to that upper edge, like that. Now in the remainder of this quadrant, we're going to continue the same cuts that we did down here. The two fifths, two fifths, one fifth. And right in here, we just want to blend the two cuts together. So where the 60 runs into the two thirds, two fifths, two fifths, one fifth, we blend. Turn it around, and on this quadrant, again, coming down the hill.
There's two fifths. The next two fifths at 80 degrees. And then we blend. And that completes the draw knife work. Next step will be the spoke shave. The next step is to smooth out the draw knife cuts using the spoke shave. It's important to note that I did all the draw knife work before going to the spoke shed. So I didn't do a quadrant with the draw knife and then work with the spoke shave. I did everything with one tool before moving on to the next tool. It's a lot more efficient to do all your work you can with one tool and then move on to the next one. You save a whole lot of time and you get a better result if you're not jumping back and forth between operations. On the edge of the seat, it's important to push the blade, to push the spoke shape. The reason being that the tool is fairly light in weight, and this is, fairly, this is heavy work to be doing. By pushing it, I'm also able to put a lot of the weight of my shoulders and torso on the tool to help control it. If I were pulling the tool, I wouldn't be able to do that. Here's another tip. If the tool is chattering on you, there are a number of reasons that can cause that. One is the grain. Try rotating your spoke shave so that you're riding across layers of grain. If that doesn't work, rotate the other way, and that will prevent chattering and, and uh, uh, a washboard effect with the spoke shape. Another, course, another cause of chattering can be just the, the seat moving in the vise. Notice that when I work, I often put my leg up behind the uh, the seat like this and actually lean into it so that I am supporting it and keeping it from vibrating. A lot of weight from my shoulders and my torso on the spokeshaft. Okay, then that wraps that up. The spoke shave will produce a gentle track that you can see if you rotate it in the light. You can sand that out if you wish. I do not, and I don't because the old guys didn't. This was the surface they left on their work, and it's sort of a tip of my hat to them. Uh, in recognition of, their, of their, the quality of work that they produced and the designs that they produced, that I'll leave that behind. Also, I'm proud of the fact that I can, with hand tools, create that sort of surface. I ha it's, a, it's, a, it's a level of my skill, and so I won't sand that out. I will leave that there, and uh, as I say, if you wish, you can remove it with sandpaper. I don't. Finally, 
we have an edge here so crisp, so sharp, that it would not, you would not be able to put a finish on it. So what we're going to do is break that edge with a chamfer, a small bevel that will also act as a decorative feature. This is real easy to do with the spoke shape. Once again, you have to be thinking in terms of quadrants, and we only have to go as far as that uh, uh, point of intersection with that line right there. Once again, I'm pushing the spoke shave, and I'm going to produce about a quarter inch chamfer at about 45 degrees. It's just a decorative touch. Now we go. Next step before I, I, I finish up is I want to look at the back edge or the lower edge and see that it's uniform relative to the outside edge. Now, it's not a concentric shape because we got a different cut up here than down uh, than the two-fifths two cuts. I'm noticing I'm a little high here. There's a little bit of a dip. I want to smooth that out. And I'm just a little, this, this edge right here is not quite the same shape as down here. I'm just going to touch that up. Thank you for watching this content. I hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to this channel. And check back frequently for more Windsor chair making tips and tutorials.